All right. Um, so I am guessing that everyone is tired um, after this past weekend, like I am. Uh, so <laughs> we want to be respectful of, of everyone's time. But first things first, like I really want to take this time to do a race debrief and let's talk about Browns Creek. We shook the rust off um, after two years and what went right, what went wrong? Like, what are some things that, uh, that you want to add to this that we need to be aware of? And I'll just open that up to all of you and you can just kind of chime in as you want. Hey, Sean, it's, it's Brent with Fayetteville Dirt Grinders. So mm -hmm. the one thing I noted is that the start times shifted a couple times from what was originally published. Um, yes. Now I'm sure that due to the, um, you know, the, the heats um, and the number of people in the heats, is that something that we're going to be able to use as a metric going forward, or is that going to be kind of unique to each venue? It's not going to be unique to each venue per se. There were a couple of things that um, that kind of caught us off guard. We somehow were using an older set of start times, um, and that was purely our flub. Um, so we were adjusting on the fly, and then um, – because of some of the sizes of the fields, we were having to adjust those um, staging times and we did not get it right at all. Um, at one point we were like kind of communicating by radio, doing math in our head and just like trying to do the best we could playing catch up on the fly. Um, and so we will endeavor to make sure that that is a much more, um, much better uh, plan from the beginning there may be some shifts if we see longer than anticipated uh, finish times, especially with those uh, wave one. We got a couple of riders that were maybe still out on course due to mechanicals that kind of pushed us past what we would normally have a time for. So we kind of are like delaying a couple of minutes that way. And as soon as we get a delay of a couple of minutes in one wave, or one category, it throws us off for everything else. So it, it's sort of like a, an ongoing sort of domino effect. Um, but we should have a little bit better sense of what the start time should be, because I think we started off kind of on the back foot. And so, yeah, we will do a better job of having those communicated. The other thing was at that point, we were not able to really coherently get that across to the announcer and kind of make those updates in a in a manner that allowed all of you to anticipate what was going on and we're, we're going to try and do a better job of that moving forward but definitely good feedback thank you can i ask a question real quick sean absolutely so i think the thing with the start times was that I th you originally had set up to have a, a separate start shoot and finish line yes and at least looking at the next right flyer it looks like the start line is completely separate from the finish line is that correct yes and that was supposed to be in place at browns creek but on friday given the uh amount of people that were available to help with the setup it was sort of a um uh in the huddle kind of audible call to just do it the way we'd always done it and that sort of shifted things around too but we we anticipate being able to have that separate so that we can run the race starts kind of more regularly without having to worry about those incoming riders finishing um, and the overlap that that would cause. Okay, thanks. Yep. No problem. Some of our venues will allow that and others will not, but we'll certainly try to do our best to do it. Hey, Sean, it's Murph. Hey, Murph, it's Sean. A, number one, uh, the good. The good was a plenty. And let's look at, I'm going to look at uh, from two angles, uh, student athletes point of view and 
sort of the new student athletes that came in from um, a new team that I'm helping to coach. Uh, smiles from ear to ear, nonstop. Um, so excited, so excited to go back home and tell their school and their teammates that weren't there what it was all about. So if it was a business and that was our customer, I think we have a lot of customers that are walking away extremely satisfied. Um, in addition, some new coaches that have been there for the first time, same thing. Um, Tim Shipman, who's on the call now from French Broad, sent the note out last night to his entire team, like, oh my God, it was amazing. So that, that feedback, that verbatim, I think is very, very powerful. Uh, the volunteers that I went to set up to learn what that was all about for the first time and the amount of work and the hard work that goes into this was mind blowing to me and extremely respectful. I, I, tremendous respect I have for those individuals was outstanding. One tiny little blemish um, that I had heard secondhand from a very reliable source. There was one coach who apparently didn't attend the pre-ride, excuse me, didn't attend the coaches meeting or the, or the information didn't get sent down to that coach. It was a male. During the pre-ride, he was yelling at a team in front of him, why, why are you stopping so much? So I know that that's a very much of a one-off, but it comes down to communication. We just need to continue, even tells me, I need to continue to communicate more to the teams that I'm involved with. So I commend everybody that was involved. And from, from my point of view, um, it's, as with any any kind of position like you would have in an organization, like oftentimes my exposure is more with the downside of things. And so it can be somewhat disheartening, but actually in that, that initial coaches meeting, realizing that 99% of you read the emails that get sent to you was like a such a an awesome thing for us to realize that yes most everyone is getting the communications that we're getting and you kind of were on top of things and you knew what was going on and i just want to say thank you for for your time and your attention because that makes our lives a lot easier whenever we know that we can communicate directly with you in a way that you take seriously and you you listen and you respect what it is that we're um, asking of you. So thank you so much for all of that, because that that makes things run much smoothly, much more smoothly. Um, and as far as the course preview, uh, that's just, I think, that's something that we want to, you know, really, really make a part of our race weekend culture is this whole pre-ride, re-ride, free ride, clearly communicating that clearly communicating the expectations and, you know, being respectful of those times. Um, we're trying to add some structure to that time period where before there wasn't, it was literally just from 1.30 to 5.30 kind of free for all. And we really tried to break it up to give all the space for all of the different levels of riders and all of the coaching that need to take place. So um, let's just keep, you know, as a group, just like making sure that we incorporate that into everything we say and talk with with our with our coaches. And, you know, by all means, like although we say we ask that a head coach be present at those coaches meetings, um, you know, bring all your coaches if, if you if you want to, like make sure everybody gets it. Um, I'll buy a bigger speaker so that uh, my reedy little voice can can project even further or I'll get a. Uh, a interpreter like Jeff LeBlanc who can uh, yell really loudly to just like do my voiceover acting for me. Um, Pete, I see that your hands up. What's up? Yeah, it was one of my coaches. He was late and actually I didn't even get to talk to him before, before he went on course. So we'll have a discussion to practice. I know who he was. He's okay. High strong. <laughs> okay, high strong. Okay. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just a matter of like making sure that our student athletes understand too, like, you know, I'm an experienced student athlete. I don't need to be out, out there right now. I need to give space to those newer student athletes that need to just really take a, a long, hard look at this course. And so that I'm not running over or running into anybody. Um, and, and just kind of fostering that sort of respect for everyone. So there are new riders know like now is not the time for you to be on course anymore. Like we are going to get off and let our more experienced student athletes get out there and take a look at things the way they need to. So definitely. 
we appreciate that very much. Just one thing to add. I think it's also important that as we're communicating is just to remind even towards the end of the course preview and we're in the free ride section, our student athletes shouldn't expect that they're going to go 100% on the course. They should expect that there's going to be a chance that they're going to have to stop at any moment, that there's going to be traffic out there. And so we just want to be respectful of that. And so I think it's just setting that expectation that these aren't hot, hot laps. You know, you're looking at 70% of, you know, what you're going to do on race day. It's really just to get a sense of, of what the course is. Um, so I know in, you know, other situations, there is some sort of expectation that you can do a full on hot lap, you know, in other venues, but, um, you know, for the safety of everyone, we want to make sure that there's that clear understanding of, of what this experience is going to be and that you're never going to have an open course just to, to rail a hundred percent. And Pete, thank you for uh, acknowledging that and uh, addressing with your coach. Yeah, ditto. Thanks, Pete. Hey, Sean. Yes. This is Carolyn Prey um, from Holy Trinity and Charlotte Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. I totally agree with pre-ride is definitely start and stop. I think one constructive criticism I have, we were behind a team that stopped a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And we, you know, we have a new mi middle school team, so we needed to stop too. Um, but she was stopping right on the trail. Is there any way that we can, when the team stop, can they stop off the trail so that if we're not stopping, because we literally had to stop and wait every time that team stopped. Um, and there was really like, we didn't want to be um, rude to anybody. So we just yeah. patiently waited. Um, but we're hoping in the future that people can be told if you're going to stop, great, stop. But pull off the trail so the team behind you can slowly pass you um, and absolutely. move on to our next site. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that, you know, that's part of what we're supposed to be doing as coaches in routine uh, rides and trail practice on trail is that if we come to a stop, we are all pulling off to the same side. So that's an easy one for us to just like reinforce what we already are supposed to be doing on trail rides. We need to continue doing that in course preview so that we are making room for other traffic that is on the trail to get past us safely. So yeah, absolutely. Sean, this is Abby Walker. Yes. Yes, First of all, yes, yes. Um, I'm just gonna tell you that uh, our team had a great time, athletes, coaches, everybody. It was awesome. Um, my only constructive criticism, and I already briefly talked to you, but I just want to remember to mention it again was, mm -hmm. Um, being the head coach of the team, I did the coaches meeting and the coaches pre-ride, which was val very valuable. Um, and I would have liked to have also been able to do the grit pre-ride. Yes. So I would love for you to consider pushing that schedule back and giving those coaches an opportunity to do the, the course preview with you all before taking the girls out on course. Yes. And um, I've already begun that conversation. Okay. Uh, the, I'll, I will tell you the, the issue that we start running into is just time in the day and yeah. course set up and all that kind of stuff. So we will, we will do what we, what we can to accommodate what you're talking about for sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Other constructive, uh, feedback. Hey, Sean, it's Ryan. Yes, Ryan. Um, and we've already said a lot about the, pre the, the, the preview and I would agree I think I mean based on past years it's it's gotten a lot better I think a lot of us early adopters remember how things were so it's a lot <laughs> better I saw I did see some students out on their own sort of before the free ride I, I tried to talk okay. to them a little bit I think I mean it wasn't a big deal I guess I think we should just keep telling people I, I think the message is working and we should just keep messaging it maybe even a sign at the start or something that people see but yeah, I think compared to the way it used to be, it's great. What I really wanted to say was on the start time shifting thing. I mean, this is going to happen. It happens without, you know, with the best planning. Is it possible to send that information out over that text or I don't know, just some other way to get it out to people? Because unless you were really trying to pay attention to what was happening, you might not know. I don't know how to do that, but. Okay. So I like somehow race, get it out to people. Race day is scheduled change uh info on um some sort of electronic update right. okay 
All right. So like with the with the weather call, like being able to do that too. Yeah. Okay. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm wondering, do you think maybe some type of uh, like maybe signage at the um, start uh, banner to kind of designate like this is pre ride, this is re ride, this is free ride might help. That's kind of what I was thinking. I mean, obviously you could enter the course after the start, right? So, yeah. you know, we're not going to solve all problems, but that might help out a little bit. Um, I, I, I like, I think the bottom line is it's gotten a lot better than it was. And, and so it's already working. So I think we should just, just continue the messaging. I think if the, the name I said, I told my coaches about it and one of them was like, that's great name. You know, it makes sense and it's easy to say. So I think that stuff yeah. helps out a lot. Probably the thing All that right. you said resonated with me the most that, that sent that message is you said at one point that it, this is not, these are not training laps. This is not, you're not out <laughs> here to, uh, if you, the training all happened before today. If you're out here trying to train the day, it's too late. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's a combination of um, the enthusiasm of youth and um nerves and just everything the excitement it's just easy to go out there and like i'm just gonna blow out a couple of laps just to you know kind of like work it out and see what all i can do um and some student athletes can do that some student athletes you know obviously they're just wearing themselves out but just kind of like tampering that expectation of like this is more about just checking things out kind of thing And um, so you're saying like a big sign dry erase board. Yeah, um, we can look at that too. So um, just something visually um, in case people aren't checking their phones, but if they walk by the NC ICL. <coughs> okay. It, it was posted, but yeah, it is small. So we can work to try to get that enlarged, but registration did do a good job of having a printout and obviously as we talked about the the times did change so i did attempt to make sure that when there was changes we were communicating that there um but to your point it would be nice if it was just bigger so it's just a drive-by of like what's going on instead of having to go up so we can work on that for sure hey sean it's 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 richard from charlotte catholic i, I think two things one was yes I think the I think the porta potty capacity was a bit light by the end of the day. Uh, not much else probably needs to be said there. So let me let me speak to that first off because this we had a big conversation about this yesterday Maybe. after um, I noticed that it was one of my top three worst uh, porta potty um, experiences on at the end of the day on Sunday. Like I was like, oh wow, I've seen some things in porta potties and this is right up there with it. Um, mm -hmm. That was more porta potties than we've ever had. And um, what we'd like to ask is that um, y'all need to poop before you get to the the venue. And and like, you know, Walmart, like whatever, like you need to go, like there is y'all are just you're full of poop and it's coming out all weekend long <laughs> it's pretty insane but yeah we are um we keep up in the ante with the number of, of mm -hmm. porta bodies that we get but the running out of wash water and stuff that was a big problem too i mean it, it is we keep kind of doing this and i'm gonna let todd speak to this because todd is our um race director and he kind of runs all of these things so take it away todd yeah that that has been noted uh that was definitely noted like you said yesterday uh, we have already requested for a Saturday afternoon refresh going forward. So Saturday afternoon, the companies will come out, uh, do a dump, refill the water stations and uh, toilet paper and paper towels. So mm -hmm. that should be fixed for all the follow on races. They're not allowed to take a dump in our porta potties. They're just <laughs> dumping. <laughs> They're just going to have urinals. That's <laughs> next take subject. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so so the other thing was i was trying to put my finger as to kind of what was driving the schedule changes um but one of the things i noticed this is like that was only my second nike race and first as head coach but i thought i noticed that on some of the waves uh the fastest class leader would go through and finish but those that person had just lapped like wouldn't pull off they, they would continue on and do that lap and i might right, have been mistaken we, but i wanted to kind of 
ask about that because most racing sports I've been to, if you get lapped, you get pulled off, and most people don't mind because they're kind of gassed at that point, anyways. Does that drive like the schedule shifts or? or uh, I, I didn't, no, I see that, right? it it doesn't because we we anticipate the length that the the race should take, mm-hmm. not based on the fastest rider, but by someone basically kind of mid pack ish kind of rider. And so we, we don't really go by laps, although we break it down into laps. We talk about time on course. And so rather than going like, oh, you got laps, so you're, you're finishing on the leader's lap, it's more of the fact that you get across and start your last lap before a designated time in order to continue on. Okay. Um, and you may see it referred to in some instances as the qualifying for the bonus lap um there's weird language out there for for nika the way they kind of word it sometimes but it really is about like we kind of guarantee everyone to have this sort of time on course regardless of how fast their their leader is so it's slightly different from traditional races but yeah i i understand like having a race cyclocross you know you you finish on the leader's lap you know you get lapped you're you're finishing whenever they finish kind of thing so it is a little bit different and that doesn't really drive these shifts these shifts are really more like somebody you know we anticipated the race taking 33 minutes for the the slowest rider and it took 34 or 35 or 36 minutes so we're kind of like waiting just a few minutes to kind of switch over yeah i think having the electronic updates of that would help then because i went and warmed up our varsity and jv2 guys and they sat for an hour (laughs) so i was like yeah sorry guys (laughs) yeah yeah, and and also, um, you know, having the, a dedicated start that's separate from the finish that will also help with us being able to run races without yeah. having to wait for those last few riders to finish. Um, when it's th- like you saw at Browns Creek, we have to wait for those riders to finish, or we're waiting for a big enough gap. Like we kind of are monitoring where they're at um, on course based on the, the course marshal reports. And whenever we would do a double check to see if there was a gap we could start a race in, they were literally passing the last course marshal. So we knew that they were going to be coming out of the woods soon. Hmm. All right. Um, ooh, a set of colored flags. Um, so our, um, our uh, former military guys, they'll love the use of flags. So I think they, they were Signal Corps. So we'll get you a very complex set of, of flags to designate all of the things that are going on. Um, um, other, other feedback. Yeah. Hey, Sean, it's Michael Lashley, uh, Wake, South Wake Trailhawks. Um, I noticed that the main campground area, there were a lot of empty sites there, mm-hmm. but yet the reservation system was full. So I'm not even sure if you guys were aware of that, but it wasn't, the campground was less than halfway full or thereabout. Um, so I am not the one to speak to this. Who was handling uh, camp, camping registration? Was that you, Michael? Uh, I was or updating was Eventbrite. Are you talking about tents or RVs? Or the RV lot that was down the road from the main tent, you know, the main race area. Yeah. So for the RVs, what we did is we had a certain amount of spaces that were open to the general public. And then we reserved some for volunteers to encourage people to volunteer. And so it was the volunteers that did not fill up. Okay. The, um, as I understand, the, the camping is full for the next race in Salisbury, or is, is there still some availability there? I would have to check. Hold on. So while he's checking on that, it's, is, it's, uh, it's full. So while Michael's looking, it, I don't know if you need to provide a n- number of spots still available for tent. I know RV is already full. But I put in the link, <clears throat> excuse me, at the top of the uh, chat is the link to the Salisbury venue. Um, I spoke with Salisbury today, and we've added a little bit more of tent camping at that venue. 
And if our tent spots are full, we do have the ability to add a few more event bright spots for tent camping. Um, so that check out the map and look at where that tent camping is going to be. The other big, big announcement we have to make for Salisbury. If you are RV camping and somehow your drain flushes open, there is a substantial fine for dumping any of your wastewater at an RV. So don't have your kids messing with the valves. Don't be playing with turn knobs or anything. They will be watching and they will be monitoring because they will have staff on site on grounds this weekend. So please pass that along to your coaches and your families. And why did you lose your voice, Ben? I don't know. Some race event this weekend I stumbled upon. <laughs> All right. Other uh, feedback? Actually, it has to do with yelling over loud noises. Um, <laughs> um, I, I know everyone wants the music because it gets you pumped up, but is it possible to hold off until after the coaches meet? For those of us with hearing damage? Um, so I am I am gonna um, talk about this too because if your tents are against the PAs, like you can barely talk to your own team. Like and my team was in that position, like we were kind of yelling at each other and not able to communicate very well. Um, so I I want to kind of figure out that that as well, because I have um, you know, older ears and they do. They are sensitive to the louder sounds. But then I'll tell you that if you go to the other side, like all the sounds are muted. So it's almost like we've got to figure out a balancing act for it um, to figure out how to make sure that everybody can hear without it being overwhelming to some and um, just audible to others. So I'm right there with you, Ben. I mean, uh, Pete. What'd you say I couldn't hear? All right. Hey, Eastwood, could you check on the tent camping spots on Eventbrite for Salisbury? Someone put in the chat that looks to be full. It is. It is. I also put it in the chat. The <coughs> open spots oh. are for volunteers for Friday shift or Saturday a.m. shift. Could you say that one more time? Are those the 20 tent spots that are just now open? That's for They're volunteers. not open. They are for volunteers. Okay. So if you're volunteering for a Friday shift or a Saturday AM shift, you'd be eligible for those. And it's, those are tent spots. I believe so. And for those tent spots at Salisbury that are on the ball field, it would be a similar situation as what we do at Mayadam. Tents only, no vehicles in the ball field. And also around the uh, pavilion bathhouse up there, bathrooms at the uh, ball fields. Vehicles will go in the parking lot and you'll walk your stuff in. All right, Don, you have your hand up. Yeah, Sean, um, I'm just curious how many uh, folks did not show up for the race that registered. What was the melt there? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think mm -hmm. it was any appreciable number. Um, but uh, I don't have an exact number for you. Okay. Michael, do you know? I saw it and I don't remember off the top of my head the exact, but it was less than 20, I think. Okay. Or just as a follow-up, I don't know if you have ever considered a waiting list for folks that you know 48 hours or something they can get in because somebody doesn't show up and it's kind of complicates your registration process well we wouldn't know if they're going to show up or not you know unless they said i'm not going to come but we actually i don't think i've ever heard from a family letting us know that they weren't going to come to an event we we usually don't know until we would call a student like this first one since we weren't doing call-ups we wouldn't even have known 
but then um you know after that it's more uh whenever we call them up and they don't appear that's when we know that they're not there is there yeah. anyone that brought that down to the coaches level sean so like the immediate coaches team directors head coaches will know if their riders are there or not and they could feed that information up or does that not work yeah we we don't have that kind of fidelity because we're literally like i'm in the start shoot and i'm just seeing kids walking towards me and i'm putting them in line and getting them lined up so it's it's bang 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 uh the other aspect the thing to keep in mind is if a student athlete um misses their call up um if they are getting a call up if they miss their call up then they slot in at the back so um that's just the penalty for not being there when you when you're called up um and not being a call up yeah, Sean, I'm just thinking that, you know, plans change for people and if people know there's a limited number of slots and they know they're not going to show up if they could, you know, put their, you know, transfer or, you know, give up their slot if there are people who are waiting to get in. Because I know, and I assume you've got, I mean, that's another question I have is any, any idea of how quickly things are filling up for these different slots? Are they full and so six six seven b eight b uh filled up in 30 minutes this morning okay um as last i checked uh freshman jv1 boys have plenty um not plenty but they still have spots so th this was a topic i wanted to uh to talk about since it's been brought up um mm -hmm. so we currently send off 75 boys in JV1, 75 boys in freshman, and that is a 150 kid wave, three laps. Mm -hmm. I see no reason why we can't send off 75 eighth graders, seventh graders, and sixth graders. We've never had more than 75 kids in the past go off in those waves anyway. I know that there's a lot of kids who are currently dealing with pit zone like it's Ticketmaster trying to to log in at 720, particularly the sixth graders who if their internet connection is not quick enough, they're not they're they're locked out of the race. Mm -hmm. Um we really and you know at least the seventh and eighth graders have can can go to A and get a chance to race. I'd like to see 75 kids in each up to 75 kids in each one of those slots in the first race. But at a minimum, we need 75 sixth graders being able to, to race. And I, you know, I, I, I don't see, I, I, I watched every one of those kids go through the slot. The, the, the eight B seven B six graders are not at the speeds that the, the bigger kids are. I don't think it's a safety issue. I, you know, it's five more rows of kids. And then I think that's going to let almost everybody who wants to race on a given weekend be able to race. All right. Um, we will, you know, certainly discuss that um, with uh, league staff and bring that forward to them. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a Nike guidance that we're following. But, you know, the big, the big difference here is it's a one lap race. So it's one wave, that wave moves forward, and then it's the next kids go behind it. I, you know, the, the uh, issue. The, the issue is the, the uh, passing events. And with sixth grade boys at Browns Creek in 2020, the lead 26th graders passed roughly 40 kids in one lap. And and both of those kids were national. That, that was two kids. They were national championship caliber riders. Most of the no, kids it, did it, not try it wasn't, to pass that many. It wasn't, it wasn't just two kids. It was a pretty substantial number of kids. It was a substantial number of kids. Two kids riding 16-minute laps, and the other kids were riding 20-minute laps. I mean, it, you know, it – it was only two kids who were going that much faster than everybody else in the sixth grade wave. And we don't have that this year. 
All right, I respect what you're saying. Um, I I disagree on your numbers because um, I have those numbers as well. Um, and just seeing the the passing events and what I modeled on that race um, and saw the the finishes of all the finish times, it's just that's that's where this is born out of is at, that concern for safety. And at so. a bare minimum, that concern has no bearing on having seventy five sixth graders go off because, like I said. You can seventh graders and eighth graders can at least, you know, and looking at the times this week, there's all, you know, there's a, a half, half dozen eighth graders who could go to a from the eight B's. I didn't really see any six and seven, maybe one or two, six or seventh graders who would go to the a, but let, let the sit, send off 75, sixth graders because they're, they're the ones that, really deserve to have a race and there are no no more safety issues on sending off 75 sixth graders because there's nobody behind them all right all right i will bring that to the league staff thanks hey sean this might yes. be a crazy idea for some people but what about having two sixth grade waves i mean you, you can't compete against some guy in your other wave but you know, it's sixth grade people are like, let's let them race and just split them up. Yeah. It just adds time to the day. Um, and that's, that's the other issue. So, um, but you know, we've, we've discussed all of this, like all of these ideas were put forward. Um, and you know, the 50, uh, the 150 rider wave cap was, um, in order to allow more people to ride rather than saying a 500 racer cap on the entire event. So, you know, we're just doing our best. The end result of all of this is that a, we don't want this to happen. B we need more people to step up and thank you to those of you that were shadowing as race crew, because you are going to be the solution to this issue for next season because being able to run concurrent races allows us to have much more open, no, no caps on fields and be able to get everybody racing, which is what we truly want. So this is just a worst case scenario that we're trying to do. And I see someone that whose name is not, um, not uh, appearing is on an iPhone. You have your hand up if you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, this is Shannon in uh, Yancey County. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I had experience where I couldn't register my eighth grader. And I was just mm -hmm. wondering, I, I totally understand, you know, the situation, but I'm wondering if you could look at what the numbers look like as far as, you know, how many eighth grade boys are there? And there's only 50 spots and, um, you there's know, about a hundred, there's about a hundred eighth grade boys. There's about a hundred seventh grade boys. And there's about a hundred sixth grade boys. So there's, okay. You know, it, it is, it's, it's a smaller number than the number of student athletes who are registered. Okay. I'm just, yeah, it's just you know, then half the kids. It just seems that there should be something more equitable so that for the next race, if we, if we try to register and if we don't get in again, I mean, I was right there at seven o'clock, it's going to feel pretty bummer. And I don't know, my kids never raced. So I don't know about stepping them up to that 8A, which I assume is, I think it's the longer, more advanced riders, right? And so, yeah, I don't so it's want a two race. Yeah, and I don't want to start them out like that. But yeah, um, being a new team and all. Anyways, I we'll be there to volunteer and stuff. But um, I don't know. I was just thinking of the numbers, so you know what you're dealing with. Yep. Yeah, and I have student athletes on my own teams that are just like this as well. Yeah. Is Sean? Yes. Um, I have about a 50% uh, participation rate, maybe even less in racing. Is there a way that I could say, hey, I know this kid's never going to race, so you don't count them as a racer? I have at least 12, well, probably 20 kids that are never going to race. They just show up for practice and they mention. Um, okay. No, that doesn't really affect in? anything because it really is about number of student athletes on course at a given time. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. And so, yeah, that, that wouldn't really do anything. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, I've got student athletes that, you know, they raced yesterday, they were all jazzed, and then they didn't get in today. So, you know, I, I know exactly what you're speaking. I've, I've got the same thing happening on my teams as well. Um, and so it is it is a bummer. It's a difficult thing for kids to, to process and get through. But one of the things that we're doing is encouraging them to come out to the venue, to participate in the course preview so that they can ride the course, um, to be there to support their other uh, teammates in their races and that sort of thing. So just fostering that team culture as well. So using it as an opportunity for them to still be a part of the team and still be a part of the experience um, without necessarily being able to race. Um, and I see Keith, you have your hand up. Hey man, uh, my name is Keith Altano from the Guilford Gears. I'm level three and been involved for four years. Mm -hmm. I got to say, man, you guys have created some magic. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, a Nike race is a magical thing. I've been involved uh, working with you since 1990. Uh, but we need to understand we're not capping races. We're excluding kids from participating in the magic. It's not a cap. It's exclusion. And especially it's a socioeconomic exclusion because uh, we've got angry parents, frustrated coaches, talking about not coming back next year and crying kids. And uh, on my team, uh, it was the parents that uh, were in a single parent situation and had to go to work or the parents that weren't comfortable with computers uh, you know, there's an IT coach on my team. He works in IT. It took him 35 minutes. So we got to fix this. And we got to ask some hard questions. And one of the questions, and by the way, what I do for a living is uh, work with organizations that are struggling with organizational culture, uh, schools and civic organizations. We got to ask a question. One, it's been two years since the last race when it was clearly overcrowded. In those two years, there were no races staged and the races are a tremendous workload, but our leadership didn't have them. So what was our salary leadership doing? And I don't ask that, and what was our leadership doing? I don't ask that out of spitefulness or to attack anybody. We gotta figure out why we're here. Like, how did we get here? And the reason why we need to ask that is in nine months, we're starting a new season. So what do we do different? Because if the process that we use for two years got us here, then it's foolish to think if we use the same process, we'll fix it in nine months. And then as far as getting volunteers, um, I'm good at that. And there needs to be like a Manhattan Project because Sean, I read from you, that it's contingent on getting volunteers. And I haven't seen like an overarching call for volunteers. And if you're using a newsletter, a lot of the, the organizations that are either failing or mediocre use newsletters, they got a 20% open rate and a 3% read rate. In other words, only 3% of people that get a NICA news actually read it all the way. So we've got to use direct email. And we've got to have a Manhattan Project to get you the volunteers you need. I can help with that. But there's things we got to do. We've got to do serious damage control because we got coaches that are considering leaving. You know, I, I, I met a coach. I talked to him. I really respect him. And uh, he's on my team and he's put hours upon hours. And he's like, man, if my kid can't make it, I'm gone. And I get that because he's put eyes at everything. And uh, we need a letter of apology from our leadership. And then I can help you get the volunteers. Uh, I know how to do it. Uh, we need to have direct email. Newsletters don't work. And we need to have a subject line like, help us and the caps volunteer. Then we need to directly plug them in to the complexity of your system. And like I said, it's amazing. What you guys have done is amazing. It's just amazing, but we are gonna lose people this season because it's only race two and the frustration level is going up. I can help you. My name is Keith Dalton with the Gears. I can have all the volunteers you need at the next race 
standing by, but we can't do it like we're doing it because I don't think it's working. Um, I think we need a lot of volunteers for you to have the solution of either, apparently, because I've called a lot, there's, there's no other league doing this that I can find, uh, excluding kids. The solution is either on a, a two race weekend, Saturday and Sunday, or to have a league, separate league, Western and Eastern. I can help you get the volunteers. Um, we just have to do it different. The messaging, I mean, Mike Long had a bullhorn in his hand yesterday. And a perfect thing to say was, hey, if you're unhappy with the caps, please come by, give us your name, give us your email. So when going after volunteers or trying to change the organization, you got to go direct. And uh, once again, uh, I'll get off, but I have tremendous respect for you guys. Um, but what's happening right now is actually unethical because we took people's money in the beginning of the season and we didn't tell them that your kid might not be able to race. And you know, a lot of us are uncomfortable with that. You know, I'm looking at a parent trying to explain, and I don't have answers. So uh, I'm here. My name's Keith Dalton with the Gears. Uh, this is what I do. Um, I love to help. Uh, we need to change how we're trying to solve this problem because we need to solve it. And once again, so much respect for you guys and the magic you've created. But we need to get on this. And uh, thank you so much. I'm here if you need me. All right, Keith, thank you. And I will make sure that Mike Long reaches out to you. Thank you. He needs to reach out to everyone that's upset. Well, reach out to you specifically with what you're um, what you're saying so that he yeah, can Yeah, I can get you the um, people. Let's rock and roll. All right. And Sean, I, I want to piggyback off of that a little bit. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that the 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 thing about having the caps on the races, I mean, it seems to me if we had caps on the actual league, then it, we, we might would not have this problem as much because it's what happens is people, like you said, people are paying their money. They're paying the, the $200 league fee uh, with the expectation that they would be able to, to show up at a race and race. I mean, you know, in the past they were able to, to register as, as late as the day of, and now it's like 25 minutes, uh, after seven, I had, you know, I've had, I had parents who rearranged their entire work day today just to log in to register their, their kids. Now the one lady, she did get her kid registered. It took her 25 minutes to get in there and get it done. But, but, you know, and I had two parents that, that were on there at seven o'clock and they did not get registered. And this is, our team is made up of completely a whole new roster this year. And after, after just this morning, they, I, don't see them coming, some of them coming back next year. And that's, you know, unfortunate, unfortunate. I mean, if we had like a, you know, if we had different uh, levels of participation, some people are not going to race. And if that's the case, then, you know, they, they come into the league and maybe they come in at a, under a different program altogether, like the adventure days or whatever. And then the ones that race, they come in and, you know, that that's going to be capped up front and not so that we don't end up in a situation like this where, some kids may never race this whole season. In fact, I've got a parent this morning that told me after, after she spent 30 minutes trying to get her child uh, registered and it didn't happen, she says, we're, not, we're just not going to race this year. It's just not going to happen for us. All right. Thanks for that feedback. All right. Other feedback? Go ahead. Um, the one other thing I'll say is, uh, since it looks like Salisbury is definitely a race that we're gonna have a separate start shoot, you can certainly spread out five, the, the big problem here is the five, the six, seven at the eighth graders. Mm -hmm. You can spread them out and send them off in their own waves you know, right now we have them set at six minute waves, send them off in 15 minute waves. And then you can have as big a field for each of those waves as you want. It's a one lap race. You can move the time up 10 minutes. You, you can make this work without adding time to the entire day. And you can get every kid who wants to race, let's say up to 75 kids. And then, you know, I don't know that you're going to have, you've never had 75 
sixth, seventh, or eighth graders sign up for a race in any of our other races, I don't think. But you can certainly, in any of these races that have a separate start shoot, just send those waves, those kid waves off and space them out more. And then you don't have to worry about them colliding with the wave in front of them. Okay. You know, I mean, it, you can make this work. You can reopen. You can you can reopen registration this week. We can get the kids registered, and I think that a lot of this angst can go away. All right. All right. Thanks for that. Suggestion. I, I think I think you can make it work. Okay. Thanks for that suggestion. All right. Other feedback. John, this is Tim White from the Gears. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So, um, so what is the long term goal? I, I know we all want to get off this registration thing, but what I, I see Nike of North Carolina doing nothing but increasing, um, you know, the, the amount of student athletes. So obviously, mm -hmm. we're at way beyond max right now. Correct. So, what is the long term goal, or or where are we? You know, if, if it keeps increasing. What, what needs to happen? What are we going to do? What's, what's the next thing? I agree with the coach that was just talking a minute ago. You know, maybe we can do little things here, but that's just sort of a Band-Aid to get by for a few right. athletes. But that is not a long-term solution. So what is Correct. the long-term solution and what needs to be well, done? So the long-term solution is that we would divide into essentially think of it as two conferences. And each conference would run four races each. Um, and then the teams in those conferences would be participating in those four races with guaranteed participation for all student athletes. And then uh, there would be a fifth state championships race that student athletes would have to qualify to participate in. And that qualification would be based on essentially standing. So if you figured like just a top 30%, just off the top of my head to come up with a, an arbitrary reason to qualify, um, and that would be then participation in the state championships event. So, it, and because I don't understand the process of what's going, it seems like there's a whole lot of standing around, at least for the student athletes on Saturday. You know, there's nothing available for the athletes until with the, the pre-ride, re-ride, and then free ride. Could anything mm -hmm. happen on Saturday? So uh, this was discussed. Um, then the the issues become then that setup needs to start occurring on Thursday. And for a lot of our volunteer staff, that requires them to then take off a second day um, off of work during the week in order to set up for the race. And then in the leagues that we have visited that do Saturday and Sunday racing, essentially people show up Saturday, they race, they go home. They show up Sunday, they race, they go home. And so the actual culture of the weekend of all of these things, camping out, kids hanging out, doing kid things other than being on bikes, um, all those uh, friendships and just all the things that sort of, as someone put it at the very beginning, the magic of the weekend doesn't really exist in those leagues because of that. It's more of a show up race and leave. Um, and so we didn't, when we were visiting those leagues, the, the vibe that we got from them was not one that we wanted to replicate. But then when we saw leagues that did the Saturday kind of Sunday racing model, that it was just much more of the environment that we were looking for with the races. Um, so that was a lot of it. The other just has to do with the pressures on volunteer staff to then set up a day earlier than they already are. Not saying that that was, you know, not considered because we considered lots of different options going into this season. Um, Thor, you were asking. My only thing is, I, my only thing is, it's better for everyone to race and to exclude people the way we are now. Understood. Sean, we've heard some great suggestions from, from lots of different people, but 
I kind of, I still feel like we're missing a little piece of the puzzle here. And I wondered if, mm -hmm. if you hear all the feedback from us, what is the next step for, for you and the league? Like, who do you guys have to go and speak to? What is that process so that we are, we understand like what has to happen after this and what might be some of the issues that you might face to get some of these things approved and get this thing moving forward? It, it's really, it's not like an approval process. It's really, as soon as I get off this call, I get on another call with league staff and I present all of the things that you're sharing with me to them. And then it gets discussed and, you know, all of the different pieces that maybe aren't being considered or aren't um, included in what you're talking about, uh, the various different people kind of talk about how it affects whatever it is that they, they have as part of what they do for race weekend. And then we just see what we can do. So it really is, it's a, it's a league level decision. It's not something that we have to go to national to get approval for or anything like that. This is what we do as a, as a core race staff. And just to kind of support, you know, the conversation that we've been having pretty much all season leading into this was the need for that league level volunteer staff that's going to be able to help duplicate what one race staff does. So that way we can hold more races to meet the need uh, for the growing league, because as suggested, um, some of these suggestions might be band-aids for this season, but they're not going to solve the problem for next season or the season after. So we are as, as Keith had, had offered his expertise in helping us get more league level volunteers, you know, we're all open to that because that's what we've been asking for. And, and we have had a couple of people stand up and they're, they're awesome. And they've come out and, you know, and they shadowed in this first race. And we're going to have them do that throughout the season so that they can get trained to be able to raise the level of supporting um, more race opportunities for our student athletes. And so that's going to be the continued ask throughout the season is, who can you know step up you all know how much volunteer time it takes to run a team and we respect that and, and that's huge and so we just need people who are able to do that to league level as well and so it may not be a head coach i mean it's really hard to balance both of those things but you know keep looking at what coaches or what um, parents or people in your cycling community that might have that time and availability and passion to to kind of help us create more opportunities for our state Um, so I'm getting a couple of questions that are along the, um, along the lines of can athletes help with volunteering? Athletes can help with volunteering in the, you know, race weekend roles of, you know, set up, you know, you can see that there's an army of volunteers that are like pounding stakes and wrapping tape and setting up course and things like that. But what we're looking for are these league level volunteers, like a race director, um, all of these sorts of things. And those really do need to be adults. They, there's not something that an athlete can at all take on the responsibility for, because there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, as far as can any of those positions be paid, you know, right now, um, that's, that's something that's being talked about, but it's not something that as a league, we have the funding to do. So we're just working through all of that as we go. Yeah, and, and in terms of paid, that's one of the positions we def desperately need is, is someone to head up sponsorship. So that way there would be revenue coming in that might be able to support, um, you know, payment for the league level volunteers. We're not going to look to pay, you know, race day volunteers. I don't think we're going to be financially in a place for that. And we don't want to look to raise any kind of costs for our student athletes or coaches. We try to keep that as low as possible to operate. So our budget is you know self-sustaining it's not necessarily a growth model where we're we're building um salaries off of the cost for our student athletes we don't want to look at that so that's another spot where we'd want help is who can help us gain sponsorships that are going to offset some of these costs and provide more incentive for people to step up at the league level So this is Brant Sampy with uh, Carolina Crushers. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing that is not clear to me at all is um, the race setup. So there are people who can potentially take off Friday afternoon, come in late afternoon and work on that, kids, adults, whatever. 
Um, and understanding that might be helpful in, in recruiting more volunteers in that aspect of it as well. So this is Ben Harbor. I'm the operations manager for the league and the head coach for Wilco Wolves. On the volunteer sign-up page for some of those positions, parking, pit zone parking, infield setup, course setup, there are short videos that Nike National has, has created. Some of them may be a few years old, but there's still relevant content about what it takes to do those particular roles. Um, so I would encourage you to review those review all of them to see which position you'd like to try to encourage your families, your coaches to sign up for. And then there's a lot of stuff that just has to happen to put on the race, um, setting up the infield, setting up the feed zone, putting tents out for the safety coordinators. All that stuff is encapsulated within that infield setup. Which, which I assume takes place Friday, right? Friday and Saturday morning. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, to get hands on help, the, yeah, the better the description of what the Friday is thing opportunities would be might be helpful as well. I'll work on that. Cool. Thanks. Put my man. name down to do it. Yep. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Key, keynote for uh, this is Todd with the uh, third grinders and race director. Key thing for the Friday setup is, is basically it boils down to manual labor. We are unloading the trailer. We're pounding in stakes. We're putting in stepping stakes. We're running tape, running uh, snow fencing, trying to get as much done as possible. That way, Saturday morning, when the bulk of the volunteers show up, a lot of it's done. So um, those I can do Friday. I mean, personally, I take Fridays off of work just so I can do this. And uh, I've been doing this for about five years now. So, uh, but I have that flexibility, I can do that. So any, but any help we can get on Fridays is awesome because that means we're that much further ahead. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate you guys that, that do come out and do that for us. Absolutely. So we, can't do it. we can't do it without you. Yep. So those job descriptions you're looking for, they're actually on the signup.com for all of our volunteer positions. If you go and look, it's just full guidelines and video at, at a link. So they're, they're there and they've been there. Uh, hey, I will also say, uh, I'm sorry. So I will also say um, part of the, the race crew with setting up um, setting the race course, we do get a lot of signups for setting up the race course by riding the bike and everything. And we love having all those volunteers that do come out. Sometimes though, my job is I can't take everybody out that does sign up for that category. Um, so if people do sign up and I get more than what I need, I usually kind of ask them if they're willing to jump in another role or if they're willing to volunteer somewhere else, um, just because it's such a high demand volunteer spot because everybody wants to ride the course. <clears throat> All right, are there other uh, suggestions or feedback? Uh, one thing that I'd like to uh, provide a reminder for, for all teams, all coaches, all parents attending, um, the pit zone is a no vehicle, no trailer area. We had two situations this weekend to where vehicles were driving through the pits at odd hours, and that's not going to happen going forward. So please remind your families, your coaches, your teams that when we park your vehicles to do unloading, that is the only area we allow vehicles. Once you're done, please put them back in parking. Please put them in your camping locations. All right, other feedback or suggestions? Hey, this, this is Brand again. Uh, yes, just Brand. One, one call out to the race crew. You know, I, I put on many races in Colorado before I moved back here. And uh, 
you can't see every risk as much as you walk through a course or whatever. And, you know, a risk became apparent after the eighth graders started. And what, what was impressive to me was the, the race crew jumping in and physically managing the risk so that the next waves didn't incur that. And I just wanted to, I don't know the guy's name. I could see his face, but um, out there with a shovel instantly on the issue, fixing it. So I appreciate that. Brent, I appreciate that. That's, uh, that, was, that was an incident that, uh, this is Bill Stevens. I was the one with the shovel. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. They call out. It was a tough moment. I uh, I wish we I could have made that decision a little bit early, but uh, considering the situation was the, uh, the last resort that we could take. And, uh, appreciate your support. Yep. Yep. Great job. Are there other um, feedback or anything that anyone would like to share? I just had a question. I was looking at the tent sites on the, and it has, I heard somebody say that there's no cars allowed, but it shows a yes. picture of rooftop tents when you click tents. So I was assuming, and there's pictures of trailer tents when you click on the Salisbury camping. Ben. Uh, I think that that's, just, that's just an event bright image that they provide for your camping. Okay. And I can try to edit that. I think previously too, there was less restrictions. Uh, the, the town of Salisbury moved our tent camping to the field. And so that may have changed things as well. So I can try to go in there and change that to uh, reduce confusion. But that's a, Yeah, I was just saying, I'm point. just gonna have to clarify that with my parents because I was, it's confusing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll try to fix that. Thank you. The only other piece of business I have for anyone is that uh, we are extending the time for uh, upgrades. Uh, this petition for exception for the Salisbury race. If you want to put in a petition for exception for one of your student athletes, we'll take that through Wednesday of this week and get them into the proper category where they can register. So if you have someone who is, was on the fence about, red, about uh, upgrading prior to Sunday, uh, we will take that and upgrade them and then they can race in their upgraded category for Salisbury. All right, if there's anything else anyone would like to share, um, specific on that point, they if they were in eight and they move up to eight A, they lose the first race, right? What do you mean they lose it for points? Yes, and so they would get the um, points of the last place rider in the eight A category, so that they would have some points. But then remember that series is based on the best four of five races, so. Um, it would harm them slightly um, at the beginning um, for a call up, but then they would be able to, to make up for it from there. Cool. Thank you. No problem. They wouldn't be starting at zero, which is what we've done in the past. And um, I think Pete was the one who suggested we start giving them the last place points. And um, that seems like it's a little bit more of a um, kind of an equitable thing to give them the last place points of 8A for the, a race that they didn't race in and then they can kind of build from there. So they're not just always going to be off the back. Yeah, and, and can and just, can I bother you one second? And no, so I had, so I have, I have a guy who's raced BMX like crazy. Mm -hmm. He's transitioning over to mountain biking. He was in the 8B group and managed the, the wipeout and went from, you know, essentially we were 56 feet out of 58, ended up 19. Is that enough to get him into 8A? What, what's the criteria for? I mean, I would definitely include all of his BMX um, experience. 
and okay. you know if he has like a race resume for that we just need something tangible that we can look at and say okay, okay this would be somebody that could could be in there right on. cool all right thank you thank you Hey, Sean, real quick, you mentioned call-ups. Are you going to, do you decide what you're going to do for call-ups for the second race? Is it going to be everybody or top 10 or? So the, the categories that have um, field limits will do the top 10, but then all the other categories that um, don't have field limits will do the full call-up. Great. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. And thank you for that suggestion. So. I think that was your suggestion and Pete's was the point suggestion or maybe vice versa, but thank you. It, it takes a village, no problem. <laughs> Sean, this is Lee Brenton with McDougal. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to give Shell a shout out and, and everybody that participated in the GRIT program this past weekend. As the father of a, a female identifying SA, she had an outstanding time, and I think everybody that was involved, especially our young sixth grade female riders, had an outstanding time with the GRIT activities and uh, just wanted to give some kudos to Shell and, and the GRIT organization. Awesome. Yes. Um, I think Shell is on the call, so um, she would have gotten that firsthand, and if she didn't, I will make sure to pass it along to her. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if uh, anyone has anything else, if not, um, thank you for holding on this long and sharing everything with us. We really appreciate it. Um, hey, but if you have something else that you wanna add, please let me know. Hey, this is Todd again. Um, yes, Todd. Hey, we're, we're looking for a campground manager. So if anybody wants to jump on it, let us know. Just throwing that plug out there. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, just so you know, I am posting the videos from our coaches calls on the league YouTube channel. So if you have coaches that were unable to be here, or you just want to make sure that your coaches are getting all the information, they can watch those videos at the league's uh, channel. And I have them in a specific playlist so they can get them and they're labeled by date. So Keith, I see that you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I could take parking director. Uh, I did volunteer for parking last weekend, and uh, I could take that. Someone told me you didn't have one right now. We do not have a dedicated parking coordinator. I'm yeah, I could take that. I'm, I'm ex-airborne MP. I could tell those people they're not going in the pick zone with the Suburban. And they're going to drag the <laughs> Uh, you know, hey, your, your car's got wheels for a reason. <laughs> so park the Suburban, you can lose the weight. So, yeah. I, like you, I like you already, Keith. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. That, yeah, that's awesome. Wants to tell me uh, what I need to do, I could train the crew, you know, because I am a coach. I could train them Saturday morning and then come up and check on them throughout the weekend and teach them how to yell, but be nice. <laughs> but yell. So, someone tell me what I got to do to be parking director. Your right, name's so on the much. list. We'll awesome. get out of your Do we need to take a secret vote on whether or not uh, he was hired? <laughs> I, think, I think he's in, so. <laughs> hey, I uh, want... One, one additional suggestion I want to make, and mm -hmm. I, hopefully I'll be able to help on course set up to, to do this, is we need a couple more course crossings, especially in the area of the pit zone, because no course crossings means people are Ducking crossing everywhere. Yep. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to create a situation where you need tons of volunteers at every course crossing, but let, let, let's you know, try to think about how, how, how to, how to move people reasonably across the course where we don't need to have them all manned and stuff like that. Cause like yeah, last, so right. one, so right. big, one, one big problem last week was that we, you know, we had people trying to duck through the start finish line because that was the mm -hmm. only cross cut coursing for, you know, a quarter of a mile. 
So um, just just trying to, especially for the next team setting up. And like I said, I'll try to help too. But figure fig, figure out how to how to move people across the course. All right, sounds good. At one point, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael and Mike, but we had a sign that said "cross here" or something to that effect, right? We do. I had those I made. We got to get uh, better poles for them. Okay. So, uh, Rach, you are, I, I, I completely concur with that. Uh, and I did create a course crossing, I believe, close to what you were talking about, but there was nothing to mark it. So people were still jumping between the lines of tape and things. and It was awkward. Awesome. Anything else? I hate to... Uh, yeah bring one more thing up can you hear me okay i mean it's, yes, it's the same thing we've been talking about but i was wondering um realistically about feedback for at least salisbury or the band-aid fix for the middle school size like hearing back from that like you know you said you'll have more conversations is that like realistic We're, to think that that's going to happen or like a no-go or you know what i mean just to I, tell i'm yeah, I'm not ruling anything out. Like this okay. is something that literally as soon as I'm off of this call, I'm going to be on another call. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. So okay, good. Um, if whatever we decide, I promise you that I will send out communication to head coaches and team directors within you know 24 hours of, of whatever that final decision is. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. All right. Well, we've got a lot to digest and talk about, but I'm, as always, like if there's anything else, please, please let me know so that um, I can add that to what we're going to talk about as soon as we're done here. All right, if that's everything, then I'm going to stop the recording and um, end this meeting. But thank you very much for everything that you shared with us. We really appreciate it. And all of this is going to get discussed right after this. So I will be letting you know if there are any changes that are taking place. Thank you so much for being a part of this. We really appreciate it.